Hello everyone, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dalia Kader. I'm an information security specialist. I started my interest in information security in 2004 when I did my master's in uh, University of Bristol. I followed my master's with a PhD degree in cryptography from University of Bath. And then I've done a few uh, research uh, associative jobs. And uh, during those periods, I actually did a good amount of teaching uh, university level courses. But in 2014, I decided to work in industry. I worked as a security architect since and as an information security officer. I uh, still give courses whenever I get the chance on different topics of cybersecurity. My main goal is first and foremost is to share knowledge. I, uh, on a personal level, decided that this is a non-profit project. Uh, therefore, I use uh, free sources to keep the budget low. Uh, my first course will be free to evaluate the level of interest and demand students have. Future courses, I intend to pay any profit forward. This means any money I gain personally from my classes will be paid for charities announced in due time. Uh, of course, your feedback is welcome. Any opinion, uh, criticism, uh, thoughts are all welcome. I would love to hear from you to provide best quality uh, with the means that I have. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the course. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dalia Kader. I'll be speaking about malware analysis. So before we talk about malware analysis, we have to have the basic understanding of what a malware is. A malware is any software that was designed with the purpose of harming uh, a certain victim. Uh, it takes different forms. Uh, it has different types depending on how it spreads, how it hides its traces, and so on. And it attacks the victim from a confidentiality, integrity, or availability point of view. So uh, basically, the differences between the types of uh, malware uh, are not important for this talk, uh, but to understand the concept is what matters. So it's basically software designed to harm. Uh, why do we need to do malware analysis? Well, first of all, if you understand the functionality of the malware, you understand better what damages was caused because of it. Uh, it, it, it indicates how it spreads. So if you understand how, how it spread, you would know what kind of systems were compromised if you're hit by that malware. It also gives you an idea of what it exploited. And when you understand what the malware exploited, then you're getting to know more about the vulnerabilities in your network and system, which will help you harden your environment uh, more. Uh, the, the community generally, when they're doing a malware analysis, the community shares all the signatures and indication of compromise they discovered for a specific malware. And when you share that, you can protect your environment before being hit uh, using those uh, signatures. Uh, also, you would like to know the sophistication level of the malware. Uh, ideally, you would like to know who created the malware, especially if it's a targeted attack. And basically, when you're doing the analysis, you're trying to answer as many questions as possible. What are indications of compromise? Well, we have three types of indication of compromise. One is uh, a malware-based signature, which relates to the software of the malware itself. So, for example, a hash of that executable or a hash of one of the uh, files it created and so on. Uh, Host-based signature, it's, uh, uh, malware tend to cha do changes on the environment they're hosted in, uh, such as changing registry keys, uh, changing, uh, creating new files, and so on. And that is uh, what we refer to as host-based signature. And network-based signature, the final uh, type, is basically any communication that is coming out of the malware. Malwares tend to try to um, communicate maybe to a malicious URL or a malicious uh, server, IP address. It sometimes tries to communicate to your internal network to attack other uh, systems around it. So those communications, uh, if you kind of uh, find a pattern to them, that's what we refer to as network-based uh, signature. So during this talk, we will be using a very old malware called MSN malware. It's available on the URL link provided on the slide. 
Uh, as you see, immediately my antivirus uh, detected the malware, so uh, it's, it's actually known, signatures are available, but it's a very good malware to demonstrate on the different types and methods for analyzing. So that's why we chose this malware. General rules for malware analysis. First, you don't want to uh, dig into uh, the details and focus on the details why uh, losing on the expense of losing the uh, key features of the malware because malware programs can be uh, complex programs. Also, you want to utilize as much tools as possible. Sometimes some of those tools will overlap in functionality, but that gives you uh, more chances of finding information. So you might get lucky with one uh, so uh, tool more than the other. Uh, also, sometimes uh, the different tools you use to analyze the malware complement each other. So they look at it from different angles and approaches. Uh, therefore, they either confirm your theory or add to it and so on. Uh, finally, keep in mind that it's always a race between the malware analyst and the malware creator. Malware programmers are clever and they know how to hide their traces, so you need to uh, try to be one step ahead of them. What are the malware analysis techniques used? So we can divide the techniques according how we're analyzing the malware and what we are analyzing. So how we are analyzing the malware, there are mainly two types, static analysis and dynamic analysis, with the main difference being that in uh, static analysis, you do not execute the code. You do the analysis without executing the code. While dynamic analysis, the main concept is to run the code and interact with it. Automated analysis is another way of how to analyze a malware, uh, and it depends on a, th a third party using um, vendors who already uh, have the expertise and have the tools, and depending on them to do the analysis for you uh, and their automated uh, systems to do the analysis for you. We'll go into details of each one of those uh, in later slides. The other way to uh, divide the, the techniques of malware analysis is either you analyze it from a behavioral point of view, so that's when you see how it interacts in a certain environment and uh, you look for you know, the system-based or network-based uh, changes, or you analyze it from looking into the code. Of course, keep in mind that you, it's, it's almost impossible to have the actual source code of a malware, but the idea is to have the malware running and look into the uh, deassembled code and the machine code that is running in the background and understanding that to understand the malware's functionality. Automated analysis. So automated analysis, as I said, is uh, a malware analysis that uh, depends on existing tools uh, that automatically uh, analyze your software. Uh, the good uh, side of it is it saves a lot of time and workload. Uh, the disadvantages of it is, if, especially if you have a targeted attack, a malware designed for, your, for attacking your enterprise in specific, then you worry about that malware actually collecting confidential information. And therefore, when you're sharing that malware with a third party, you might be exposed. Your confidentiality might be broken. Uh, the other thing that can um, happen when uh, it's a targeted attack in specific is that third-party vendors will not understand your business. So the malware, the malware might be targeting a certain uh, business uh, functionality that is uh, specific to your enterprise, and when you're relying on third parties, they may, may overlook it. Also, when you're actually uh, having a, a, a good uh, sandboxing uh, solution, an advanced one, it, those kind of solutions tend to be uh, expensive. Finally, after the malware analysis is done in the automated tools, uh, there is some reporting that is given back, and that reporting needs a security analyst to look into it and translate it into something more uh, understandable uh, to the business. So this demo is about automated analysis, and I'll introduce two tools, VirusTotal and uh, Joe Sandbox. VirusTotal is a website where you can submit files URLs, or you can search for uh, hash functions, IP addresses, and so on. I hashed, actually, uh, beforehand the value of the 
executable MSN So here is the SHA value of MSN Messenger, enter, and we will see that VirusTotal is searching the database or actually performing the analysis against different tools, uh, different uh, anti-malwares and so on. Obviously, it is malicious. If I see this, then it's an alert for me. Uh, you can see how many uh, malwares or vendors believe that this is a malicious uh, software and uh, it's 53 out of 68. You have a lot of details, things like uh, basic properties of the file, things like a bit of history of the file, existing other names for the file, P's, libraries, imports, uh, strings, and uh, so on. Uh, you also have uh, the community and they upload sometimes information uh, as a forum. And uh, I will not go into the details of what the findings are. Uh, you can do that offline with the hash function. The other tool I want to introduce you to is called uh, Sandbox, Joe Sandbox. I have uh, subscribed for a basic uh, subscription. There is the professional one, which uh, you need to pay. And with the basic, actually, uh, you get a good amount of information already. So you have the operating systems, uh, you have a place to upload a URL, a file, or um, change the time execution. This is an interesting parameter, so you choose the parameters you want, but this one is interesting because this one um, is a virtual machine. You choose the virtual machine Joe Sandbox will use to analyze your tool. So usually you choose one similar to what you have in production so that you know uh, the compromise will be uh, similar or the information will be similar. So and you agree on the terms and conditions and then you receive an email with the results. I already done that so I have the results already here and you see the analysis and you see a lot of uh, disabled uh, uh, options that's because i'm using just the basic you have the H uh, reporting with html or pdf i'll show you it quickly what i want to show you here is you also have a network cap it's a capture for the network it's quite cool it has a lot of information uh, going through uh, quickly just i won't go into the details of course uh, due to time but you can see the kind of things that it collects uh, again, similar to virus total, the likelihood of it being uh, malicious, you can see it's red, uh, what classification it takes, uh, signatures, you'll find libraries, you'll find P's, you'll find, uh, so you'll find a lot of information. Probably what's worth um, uh, having a look at is uh, a print screen of uh, the malware. So let's look for the print. So this is, this is in the HTML uh, reporting and you see a print screen and what's nice about this is you can see what exactly happened in the sandbox. I will speed it up because, uh, so you first you'll see that a process started here, probably scroll a bit up. So you'll see a process started here and you'll see MSN also started in the screen. And uh, you what I wanted to show you is I'll speed up the process there was no interaction with the malware so the amount of information we got is probably mostly static information not dynamic analysis despite having network capture and so on because there was no interaction with the malware uh, that this is this is it to, for the automated analysis uh, we'll follow with other demos static analysis static analysis as i said before is analyzing a software uh, information without running it, without executing it. So you're looking for things like fingerprints, strings, P, headers, etc. The advantage of a static analysis is since you're not running it, if it happens to be a malware, uh, then it's safer to actually do static analysis. You ensure that way that there will be no compromise. It's also faster. With dynamic analysis, it happens that you need to interact and wait and watch what happens. So it's generally faster to do static analysis. But being safer and faster comes with the disadvantage that it's more primitive than dynamic analysis. What are the things you look for? You look for uh, fingerprints. Fingerprints are uh, hash values that link to that software that you're trying to analyze. So, for example, if you recall our uh, demo on VirusTotal, we did not submit the file itself, the executable itself for analysis. We submitted the uh, SHA-1 uh, for that executable to the uh, platform. Uh, and that counts as the fingerprint of the executable. 
Uh, strings, strings are very powerful in a, any program. It tells you a lot of its functionality because it prints messages, it gives uh, URLs, you can detect URLs in, in strings. Uh, you can detect file locations in strings, so if your malware creates a file in a certain path, you can detect that in a string. It actually also prints error messages, and that gives a lot of information about the functionality of the malware. And uh, you will see in the demo of uh, static analysis uh, a lot of uh, examples on strings. Portable executables, they are a file format used by Windows executables, object code, and DLLs, and it includes information about the code, what type of application it is, uh, the required library functions, and the space requirements. And that already gives also, again, a lot of information about uh, certain functionalities of a malware. Linked libraries and functions, if you know what the malware needs to import, uh, from uh, libraries and functions, then you already start understanding some of the functionalities of the malware. And sometimes there are libraries and functions that are used for, for very specific situations. And if you see a software actually using those libraries and functions, it's an alert that it might be uh, with bad intention. So this is the type of things you look in when you're looking into static malware analysis. PeeStudio is an interesting tool for static analysis. So we're going to use it for demonstrating how static analysis works. Uh, in order to run PeeStudio, it's a very simple uh, tool. So you click on it and uh, you go to the executable you want to analyze. So in this case, it's uh, Live Messenger malware. And you drag and you drop. So it started collecting and analyzing data. I'll pause the video for some period. So it's done um, running the analysis and it would be interesting to go through some of them. So for example, here it shows indicators and that it considers uh, with a severity level of one to 10. And uh, you see a few of uh, the indicators found are actually uh, one, such as URLs that it, the file references. It's actually uh, interesting that it thinks of it as a keylogger and categorize it as severity one because there are five references to keyboard keys. And um, it's, it's uh, a lot of blacklisted uh, strings, a lot of uh, blacklisted functionalities and suspicious libraries. And you can go through uh, more details. So usually if you were online, it can actually connect to VirusTotal and present the information here. But in my virtual machine, I don't, I'm not online, so it didn't do that. Um, you can have a look into the libraries that it uses, and you can have a look into the uh, functionalities it imports. So you have uh, f functionalities that are considered blacklisted, and you have a few of them. Then you can also have a look at strings. Strings, you'll see in dynamic analysis demo how important and useful they are. So you can see that there are several blacklisted uh, ASCIIs in the executable, such as URLs, and uh, the, those, those ASCIIs and those uh, URLs will find very useful in the dynamic analysis. And you have the resources sections. I think we covered uh, pretty much the most important bits of uh, PA Studio. You can examine that offline on your own and go into the details uh, of each tab on your own. For now, this is it for a static analysis demo. Behavior analysis. Behavior analysis is looking into and monitoring the malware's behavior inside a certain environment. So you're looking for suspicious activities and the environment you uh, try to analyze in should be an isolated environment. Uh, you have to kind of uh, know that when you're doing behavior-based analysis, that means you have to execute the program. That means you have to go for a dynamic analysis. And uh, therefore, there is always a chance of a compromise. And there, uh, that's why you want to go for an isolated environment. You don't want to do such analysis on your production. Otherwise, you, you are uh, causing a threat to your production. So 
uh, isolated environment, true, but at the same time you have to balance the isolated environment and actually try to mimic what you have in production too. So it makes no sense to have your isolated environment, for example, to run a Linux machine if your production environment is a Windows machine. The compromise on each would be different. The behavior of the malware on each will be different. What are the suspicious activities you look for? The suspicious activities you look for are uh, two types, either system-based or network-based. System-based, you will see in our demos, is uh, looking into what changes happen to the system hosting that malware. And network-based, as you will also see in the near demos, it's seeing what communication did that malware try to achieve and do. And when you understand the system uh, changes and the communication changes that took place, you have a good understanding of what the malware is trying to do. For our examples, we will be using a virtual machine which is based on Windows 8 to 1. So this is the behavior monitoring analysis uh, system-based demo. And in here, notice that we started working on a virtual machine to uh, avoid uh, any compromises. And we stopped all security controls on that virtual machine so that those security controls don't interfere in our, our analysis, like anti-malwares. So uh, we're going to be using two tools, and the idea from those tools is to actually capture registry keys, um, uh, file modifications, uh, and uh, processes, threads, and whatsoever. So the first tool is called RISHOT, and the idea of RISHOT is you start first creating a shot, then you run the malware, then you uh, create a second shot, then you compare uh, the values of it. So let's create the first shot. When the first uh, snapshot is created, do you see I can save it? It prompts me to save it, so I'm going to save it in uh, the logs, save, and call it snap1. Now the next step is, uh, basically, we will run the malware and run a second shot for comparison. We're also in between going to use something called process monitoring. Process monitoring is another tool that uh, provides the processes in real time. So it's interesting in that sense and it's different from a rest shot in that sense, but it collects similar kind of data. I did a filter to avoid having too many logs and the filter is if the process name is Windows uh, Live Messenger, then I want to see the logs of it. So I kept that uh, process. Okay, it's still running. And uh, I'll check. Okay, so now we have the process monitoring. And as you see, there is no logs, there is no capture. I started the capture, but still there is no logs because we had that filter. So let's run the malware. And uh, okay, so we have it in live messenger. And let's try running it with all its capabilities so that we can actually analyze that. And I ran the malware, so you suddenly start seeing logs here. And to get the most of it, we should interact. So I'll type in some random uh, email. I hope it's random. I hope there is no user that I'm spamming with malware malicious information. So sign in something, something. Okay. And we'll get an error message. I examine the error message. See, already I started learning something about the tool without even going into the logs. It says we're unable to sign you. It might be legitimate because I actually did put fake credentials. I don't know. So I closed the uh, error message. I close MSN Messenger. And then pop-up comes out. That's not abnormal. That has no explanation. I pick this information. I know that it must be beneficial for my analysis. And one thing, you always have to keep good notes for malware analysis. So let's close that. Let's stop the capture here. Uh, you can see that you are capturing actually registry activities, file activities, network activities, process and thread activities, profiling events, and so on. Uh, for I prefer actually reading the logs through a uh, CSV, so I'll save that to analyze. But also I wanna continue the second snapshot of wrist shot so that I can uh, compare. So the second snapshot is ready, it prompts me to save it, snap to, save. And now after it saves, we can click on compare and it will create a yet another plain text with uh, all the differences in the different uh, elements like registry keys and files and so on. So let's compare. 
after the compare has finished, uh, Notepad opens with some information. I'm not going to go into the details of the logs. You see some of the registry keys were highlighted as suspicious and as uh, blacklisted or as to keep an eye on from uh, virus total. So they are important information and this is by itself looks weird, the zeros, the list of zeros. But I'm going to cheat and go directly to what attracted my attention most. So we have two files that have been created, Windows uh, MSN setting.data and pass.txt. So control copy, already I have new information. Um, so control B, those files are created after we ran the malware. So let's see, this is wrist shots comparison. Let's see what uh, process monitor says about the same thing. So this is the logs I saved earlier from process monitor. I, unfortunately, I don't have an Excel here. Otherwise I prefer opening it in Excel. Let's see the same files, pass.txt. It has been created uh, successfully. And let's see uh, MSN setting. Nice search, maybe we have to go uh, all the way up so maybe it has been created in a in an earlier timestamp so so you go all the way up and find next and again you see that here it has been accessed by the malware messengers okay so that's cool now we see similar logs between two uh tools let's see what actually are in those files so MSN setting, there is one which came with the, the zip folder, so I'll open it and see if it's similar to the one that was created. So it was created in, well, I know it because I've done it, I know it by heart. So it has been created, the pass.txt has been created in the C drive. Let's open one. And look, we have the URL that MSN Messenger tried to access, we have the credentials in clear text, that is already very suspicious. Let's see the other uh, file, MSN setting. So it's very similar to what we got in the zip. So I wonder if there is uh, differences or are they same? So I kept this one earlier open. So you have hello. And the second one is test. So they're very similar. There is a few exceptions, but they look very similar. They seem to be like parameters that the MSN messenger uses. So. Uh, there, yeah, you see, this might be interesting. I don't know what MSN Messenger is doing with uh, this kind of strings. Um, a weird email with a weird, seems like a domain name for an SMTP server. Control copy. And I will save that in my notes too. Okay, so that's it for now. We learned about two tools. We saw what we can get from them. Uh, it's not much of in-depth. We will continue uh, more details in other tools in other demos. Behavior-based analysis uh, based on network. So basically what you're looking into in this case is analyzing the network flow, whether it's inbound or outbound. Uh, this, this network flow, you have to kind of identify which part of it is links to the malware and look for things like uh, malicious servers, URLs, IP addresses, or maybe uh, it will give you information of what kind of data it's trying to send or grab, or is it trying to learn uh, uh, more if the malware is trying to learn more on, about your internal uh, network. So uh, keep in mind that network-based analysis is one of the most powerful analysis. Uh, a lot of times uh, a software, a malicious software can go uncovered for weeks and months, while if you looked into the network and you looked for abnormalities in the network, uh, you could have discovered it uh, way earlier. We will be looking into three types of tool uh, very uh, lightly, Wireshark, Fiddler, and Microsoft Network Analyzer, and we'll be using Network Analyzer, Microsoft Network Analyzer, for al analyzing the MS, uh, MSN uh, malware. So this, is, uh, demo, this demo is related to also behavior uh, analysis, but this time about network analysis. And I decided to actually just introduce you to three tools, keep the choice of which tool you use for yourself and the situation, and use only one tool to actually analyze our malware. But I want to go through quickly three tools that are interesting. 
The first tool is interesting and it's the most common as long as I'm aware, like commonly used. And uh, it's a free tool called Wireshark. Uh, you start the capture of network traffic by uh, clicking on the uh, shark fin uh, in the corner. And let's say you open uh, uh, a browser. So you start seeing traffic going through uh, and uh, it's a typical network capture. So what that means is it will capture the source, the destination, the protocol, uh, the, the payload, the, the it's, it's, it's a lot of information that can be analyzed and looked through uh, for malware analysis. Okay, so for now, I will uh, keep it as uh, uh, the summary as small as this for a Wireshark. I want to show you another tool which is very also similar but has more features uh, for malware analysis. It's very useful. It's called Fiddler. Uh, again, it's not the tool that I'll use for the malware analysis, but it, the reason why I like this one is it can act as a proxy. What does that mean? Uh, what is the benefit of acting like a proxy? First, I can interact with the uh, traffic queries. I can modify them and fix them. And it will require for Fiddler a demo on its own to go into the details of its features. But I'll go through two which are extremely interesting in, in my personal opinion. One is uh, any process. So for example, if I want to just, I have a Firefox and I have a, a Internet Explorer open, but I actually want to just examine. So I want to have a browser for examining. So I want to see the traffic of Chrome, but then every traffic that comes from Explorer is not displayed. So that's a nice feature because network analysis can be complicated. So having smart ways of filtering it is a good uh, idea. The other tool is since it can act as a proxy, it can also act as a man in the middle and decrypt traffic. Unfortunately, here I cannot demonstrate it uh, because I already have done it before. But the moment you enable this feature, uh, Fiddler will ask if you uh, allow it to install a certificate. Uh, of course, it's needed for decryption to have a certificate so that it acts as a man in the middle. And I'll show you just uh, quickly the in, how how the proxy was uh, defined for Fiddler. So. Um, blah, 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 blah. so you can I, I actually can go internet options oops internet options mm, security no connections land settings and advanced and this is the local host and the port for fiddler so it's it's acting as a proxy cancel 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 close and again, Fiddler is not the one I'm going to use for the analysis. The third tool, this is just to give you an idea and it's up to you which tool to use. They, the same results will, will receive from all three for uh, the MSN Messenger. I'll, I'll use network, uh, Microsoft Network Analysis. I'll use Microsoft Network Analysis for this. So same as Wireshark, you start a new capture. Uh, you start. Okay, I see some traffic uh, already starting, and okay, let's try. Let's try opening our uh, uh, executable. So Windows uh, Live Manager. Uh, again, something at something dot com our famous password, sign in, close. So it's exactly the same, um, over and over the same uh, steps we do always. So now I ran the malware again. I got the traffic I need, probably stopped the traffic to analyze it. So I have a lot of traffic. Again, like the other logs, I'll be slightly cheating a bit. So what I'll do is I'll, I, I wanna see, um, a load filter. If you noticed, I don't know if I mentioned the network conversation, it's nice because you can actually filter the same way we did with Fiddler. You can filter that I want the network coming from Chrome or so on. Anyway, so, uh, okay, so it's load filter. I wanna see, actually, I wanna cheat and see, uh, do the URLs 
that we've seen, the domain namespaces that we've seen, do they exist in the traffic flow? I bet that our godfather exists because the browser opens with that. So I imagine that uh, MSN Messenger uh, will cause traffic, DNS traffic to resolve that URL. So let's supply filter. And indeed, you see several queries. Notice that now we know the IP address uh, uh, of it and uh, we can follow uh, the traffic for those specific IP addresses to understand what's happening more. However, more interesting, I actually, I knew it will find our godfather because we saw the browser every single time opening on it. I, I wonder if we will find the SMTP looking like domain name that we have in here. So, control copy. This would be interesting to figure out if we can find it or not. Control paste, find this won't run the command and let's click apply. And apply and we got after filtering indeed DNS queries for GSMTP. So now the assumption, you have DNS query for GSMTP, then probably the malware is trying to send an email. I can go in depth into the traffic, but I'm not gonna, we don't have the time. So I'll keep the rest of the analysis for the next, uh, especially that my computer VM decided to shut down, I'll keep it for the next demo. Code-based analysis. Code-based analysis, uh, to be able to do it, you need to understand uh, a little bit more about the code construction, operating system concepts, knowledge about disassemblers, and so on. So code-based analysis is trying to understand, breaking down the malware by looking into uh, th what it does on the uh, assembly or machine code level uh, when it's running. And this is a concept uh, used in uh, software reverse engineering. Uh, you use for that uh, decompiler, uh, compiler, uh, compilers, uh, deassemblers, debuggers, and so on. And uh, for us, for our case, we will use Oli Debug. But since uh, it's, it's not an easy way of analyzing uh, software, uh, I thought I'll do it in two parts. The first part is actually analyzing a software that I wrote myself using Oli Debug, where I understand already the insights of that software. And the second part is analyzing our MSN Messenger. And what we will be looking at, we will be looking at machine code, and we will be looking at uh, assembly code. So you will be looking at the program after it's compiled and the program after it's dis disassembled. Uh, before we start our demo, it's good to know uh, the windows of uh, Oli Debug. So for people who did a lot of uh, programming, uh, this might look very familiar because they would need to troubleshoot a lot of their programs. And uh, the windows here are uh, common to uh, such, such tools. So uh, at, you have the windows for disassembler, information window. You have a memory dump, the registers, and the stack window. So the disassembler window is uh, the disassembled code as it's executed. The register window shows the values of the registers at the point of a certain uh, at a certain point of the code, and the information window gives you the exact information related to the current line you're in within the code. Stack window gives you the value of the um, stack memory at a certain point. Memory dump also gives you the live memory. Uh, at a certain at the certain point of your uh, debugged program. Before you, we go through analysis, you need to understand uh, a little bit of uh, two types of commands. First, the debugging commands. Again, if you're a programmer, those are straightforward commands. You probably used it way more than I did. So stepping into a code, stepping over a code, creating a breakpoint, uh, jumping to one net reference before or after the point you're at. So uh, adding, uh, yeah, adding the breakpoints. 
Those are commands that are uh, used a lot when you're doing uh, code-based analysis. Of course, you have to understand some of the assembly com commands. So again, it's uh, jumping uh, to, to different uh, uh, reference, memory references, uh, moving values, uh, bit, uh, bit operations, uh, stack operations, and so on. So, so uh, this is uh, a demo on Oli Debug for code-based analysis. And basically, to order understand it, in order to understand it in a, a, a better way, what I did is I created a code. So I know the inside out of that code. It's a very simple code that asks for a secret word. If it's equivalent to password, it says that's correct. Otherwise, it asks for it again. So uh, this is the piece of code. And I want to analyze that in only debug just to understand how it works better. So. Just to see, this is the window for uh, assembly, this is the registers, this is the uh, stack, this is the memory uh, dump. And if I want to uh, run the program, I just state file, and this is my program open, and I open the executable, which is actually opened already, but okay. And I have the executable running. The first run will be to uh, figure out that it is actually the code we're talking about. So I'll just quickly go step into, step into, what is the secret word? First time I'll do it wrong, enter, uh, step into, what is, no, that's not the word. So, okay, so let's try this time entering the correct and step into. So it's a simple debugger, step into and step over is in every single debugger. And uh, what would be interesting is to actually, if I want to know exactly where I am, okay, now here we see it, but if I want to search, I can go uh, use, utilize the strings. They are a powerful thing. So I can say search all reference strings, and then you get all the reference strings that we used. And then another way of finding your uh, way around also by using ASCII, it, they are powerful. So it's going to the memory map and then uh, saying, okay, I want to do a binary, okay, I'll do it with a shortcut, a binary search. I've done it before, so I've done it for the word password, search, find password. And the interesting bit about this is I can actually highlight it, right click and say, create the breakpoint on that memory when it gets accessed or written to or so on. So I'm not going to do that. And what would be interesting in this code is to rerun it one time allowing modifying the assembly code such that the word password becomes a non uh, a non acceptable uh, secret word and the other time to modify it such that uh, any word is acceptable as a secret word so let's do that so i'll restart first the whole program yes and let's play around to identify the, the code that is interesting for me first is I identified the string that is a correct uh, answer by, I clicked on it, I looked into the jump, I click on that and I find that on that level there is a test that has happening and below that test if it's not zero it goes to 1170. 1170 you look at it and you discover that it's the address for know what is the secret word. So I'll modify that and see what happens. So as you see, I changed it to be uh, B119D, which points to this address that says that is correct by. And I created a breakpoint just before the comparison. And I pressed a symbol and you can see that it turned into red. So let's continue running the program. So, ah yeah, I need to enter some values. So let's say H, H, H. Okay. And enter. If we step into, now we reach the test values we want to see. So, and here you go. It says that is correct by, despite the fact that I didn't enter the right password. Now let's do the opposite. Let's allow, uh, let's stop any password from being accepted. But before we do that, let's backtrack this. So undo selection. So 
what is interesting for the next uh, one is this code. This code, what it does is, again, there is some kind of test and it's saying if the condition is jump equal, go to 9D. 9D is, again, the, uh, the point where it says that's correct by. So if it's equal, the test, then say it's the password. I want to change that. So last time we changed the address. This time I'll do it differently. I'll say the total opposite. So if it's not zero, go to this. And I'll say assemble. Okay. And uh, we might need to redo it. I don't know if it keeps it with a restart. Yes. Okay, let's see where the code was. So if we go search for, we can do binary string, but I will go for reference string and the code was around this region, yes. And the spotted code was this one. So we wanna change, no, that's, that, that's, that's the test value and that's the comparison. So let's retry, assemble. And as I said, last time we changed the address, this time I'll do it differently. I'll say if it's not zero, symbol. So yeah, now we have the values changed. Uh, let's continue running the program. All right, we need to enter something. So this time, first I'll enter a non-password, see what happens. Okay, ah, enter. So it did not accept it, which is what's supposed to happen. Now this time I'll enter the password. And again, it did not accept it. So we saw how manipulating the assembly code can be uh, difficult, but it can actually change the whole functionality. And this is what we'll do for the malware analysis. After having uh, gone through uh, all the debug with the program I created, it would be nice to actually uh, see if we can analyze MSN Messenger uh, as a malware uh, through all the debug. So we'll give a demo on how to do so. So in this demo, we're going to try to analyze MSN uh, Messenger with all the debug. So I'll first open uh, Windows Live Messenger in all the debug. And uh, let's step into the file. So we see Windows Live Messenger open. Notice that we have to do, it's uh, a dynamic analysis and we have to do it in our VM again. And uh, let's try um, examining things that we learned from the behavior uh, analysis. So for example, let's try searching all text strings to see if there is anything suspicious. So. Uh, indeed, you will find the URL that uh, was used to uh, that was that MSN Messenger tried to access, and this is interesting. This is actually uh, very interesting because you would find uh, the parameters that the MSN setting dot data uh, contains. Like, and what I think would be fun as an exercise is to actually verify what those parameters do. In order to do so, what I'll use, I'll use, I'll uh, minimize this, and I'll use uh, a memory map. A memory map is, uh, and right click, and I'll do a binary uh, search uh, for the word uh, hello. So I, I, um, I'm trying to find the word hello, so I typed in hello in the binary uh, string search, and let's press OK together. So we have the first instance, but the first instance says hello object type. It might be linked to what I'm looking for. I'm not sure, but since it's an object type, I prefer trying to first identify if there is any strings. So let's go back to the memory and let's do control L, which is finding the next instance. And indeed this time we did find a string hello. So let's highlight it, right click on it and create a breakpoint when the memory is accessed. Now back to the code and let's see if I try 
going into the code, nothing happens. And that's basically because we're not interacting with MSN Messenger. What happens if we try interacting with SMN, MSN Messenger? So I'll write our usual email, SO, and immediately we get some uh, breakpoint. So it seems like we reached what the ASCII, uh, so cancel. We reached ASCII hello, and you can see indeed that's true because you can see it in one of the registers, it's EDI, and it has the ASCII hello. So I wonder what happens if we continue typing. So let's move a step uh, through the code, back to MSN, type again, and then step into the code, back to MSN, type again. And what you if you compare what's happening in the registers and what's happening with my typing, you'd find that whatever I'm typing is being registered in ESI and the ASCII hello is still in EDI. And the code here is a loop which seems to have a sequence of uh, comparing and uh, a sequence of comparing uh, if, if it's not zero, you go to a certain address. If it's equal, then you go to another address, compare, do the same thing. So it seems like it's comparing character by character of what I input. So I wonder if, uh, what happens if we actually enter the word hello instead of SOM. So let's try entering the word hello. So I typed in most of the word hello. And as you see, we're not there yet, but uh, let's see together what happens when I type. And it seems like some pop-up appeared in... in typing hello. And it it seems to be acting as a password for certain options, which makes me think that it is uh, a, a, a password to an interface that the malware coder needs to very to set some parameters. So, uh, looking at some of the parameters, I think what I found interesting is in other. You see that the malware actually or the malware coder actually is trying to send password to a certain email and he's he can specify the cert specific smtp host and the email address so we finally figured out what hello uh, actually in implies in msn messenger what that the data file uh, does and this concludes our demos uh, thank you for uh, watching uh, to summarize what we have done, we've tried different methods for analyzing the MSN Messenger. The first method, static-based, we learned that there is a strange URL, uh, ourgodfather.com. Uh, in the behavior-based, just by running the executable, we noticed that the MSN Messenger tried to access that URL. In behavior-based system-based uh, analysis, we saw how the MSN Messenger wrote two files in our hard drives, uh, and within those two files we discovered uh, SMTP uh, domain name, and we discovered a file with our credentials in plain text. Behavior network-based analysis, we saw that MSN Messenger actually did try to have a DNS resolution queries for our godfather and the SMTP. And then finally, in code-based analysis, we found out by playing with the parameters of uh, MSN Messenger, we found out the uh, secret configuration interface, uh, interface uh, of the malware. So objective uh, of this talk is basically uh, to learn uh, uh, m the importance of malware analysis. Also, we gave a very high level uh, overview of the different types of malware analysis. We, we have uh, tried our best to explain uh, indication of compromise, uh, the definition of it on both uh, network and system base. We uh, went through reverse engineering a certain code and showing how uh, such technique can benefit us in malware analysis. Uh, finally, what I would recommend is uh, all the tools I've used are accessible. 
And uh, I would recommend that if you have a, a virtual machine and you trust that it's well isolated, to try yourself the demos that I have done and more. And uh, whether the MSN Messenger or the tools I used are available online, and uh, the references for my talk are available on this slide. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you again.